Morning, everyone. Welcome to the, to the Judiciary Committee hearing for this Friday morning. Uh, let me read the opening stuff that we have to read with these uh, live streaming events. Um, my name is Carl Rhodes. I'm the chair. This Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agenda, the 930 JDC hearing. The other members of the committee who um, will, as far as I know, will all be attending today, Vice Chair Jarrett Keo Kaloli, Senator Laura Casio, Senator Mike Gabbard, Senator Chris Lee, Senator Donna Mercado Kim, and Senator Kurt Pavella. This meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on demand video page of the legislature's website. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to a major technical difficulty, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Tuesday, February 23 at 9.40 a.m. in a public meeting. A notice will be posted on the legislature's website and that will be a video conference as well. For the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. There's a two limit, two minute time limit per testifier. If there's a temporary technical glitch during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints, um, but we will try to get back to you if we can resolve it quickly and we, when we have received your written testimony. Um, I'll be reading a list of people who submitted written testimony for each me measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website at www.capitalwithano.hawaii.gov and you'll find a link to testimony on the status page for the uh, for the measure that you're interested in. Okay, that's the preliminaries. Let's go ahead and get started on SB 160. This changes the deadline to file nomination papers for public office from the first Tuesday in June to the first Tuesday in May for certain elections. Uh, first up on SB 160 is Scott Nago, uh, Chief Elections Officer. Good morning. morning. Thank you. The the office will stand on its written testimony providing comments. Comments, okay. Have to answer question. Okay, great. Uh, next is Nali Awasa in support. That's all the testimony we have on SB 160 members questions. I have a question. Senator Kim. Um, it says certain offices. Can you articulate, Scott, exactly which offices? I believe it's moving the. I believe it's moving the, the candidate filing deadline for all offices. Just oh, okay. up a month. That's what I was. Offices up for election. I mean, not all offices. Okay, so everybody's going to be treated the same, right? Yes. Want to make that clarification? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your testimony. You said there was. Um, this it had the bill has some effects on other statutes. Could you explain that a little more? So it really has an effect on um, the vacancy statute, 17-1 uh, for U U.S. Senate. Uh, it says that it's a it's tied to a it's tied to the candidate filing deadline. So it's provided that the vacancy occurs not later than 4:30 p.m. on the 21st day prior to the date specified in 12:6. So we're just pointing out that it does. Um, there are it this moving this date moves the other dates also. What, uh, what, I guess I'm not quite sure. How, how does, how does, how will that affect the other dates? Uh, because the, the vacancy deadline is tied to the close the candidate filing deadline. So it would also move that date. It doesn't affect it negatively. It's just we're saying that moving this deadline will move other deadlines also. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is SB. Uh, 412, relating to operating a vehicle under the influence of an intoxicant, excludes habitually operating a vehicle under the influence of an intoxicant from qualifying for deferred acceptance of guilty plea or noble contender plea. First up on 412 is Calvin Tong, uh, a major for Honolulu Police Department. Oh. Hey, good morning, Chair. This is uh, Acting Captain James Slater. Uh, on behalf of the Honolulu Police Department's Traffic Division, we stand in support of this bill and uh, we'll stand on our written testimony. Available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Trisha Nakamatsu, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney. 
Morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu on behalf of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorneys Department. Um, we are in strong support of the bill. This is actually part of our legislative package and we thank you so much for hearing it. Uh, we will stand on our written testimony and available for questions if any. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Greg Akamoto, Chief Maui Police Department in support and we have Gerald Enriquez for the Maui County Department of the Prosecuting Attorney also in support. That's all the testimony we have. Members, any questions? Chair, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Senator. No, go ahead. Senator, go ahead Kim, Kim, Senator Kim, followed by Senator Casio. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to know habitually, what was the definition of habitually? Is that, um, I'm looking over the bill, I'm not sure that it's defined. Um, it's not defined in that. It's a standalone statute, Senator. Uh, so that is currently two prior, anyone with two prior OVII convictions in the last 10 years. So this would be their third offense in the last 10 years. Thanks for that clarification. Senator Casio, thank you. Yeah, that was my same question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, do I have any? No, I don't. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, SB 421 is next, amends the manner in which a vacancy in the membership of the state Senate is filled and certain time frames relevant thereto. Uh, first up on 421 is Scott Nago for office elections. Thank you. The office will stand on its written testimony and support and be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Uh, Gerard Silva in opposition is the only other testifier we have. Members, any questions? Uh, I do have a question. Um, Senator Casio. Uh, why, why would the, um, I'm sorry, this is 421, correct? Yes. Yes. So um, wh why should the vacancy um, be 10 days, 10 days before trigger the appointment uh, for, for filing? So we actually, this bill would actually take care of the situation we had in the 2020 general election room. Um, we had the senator from Pearl City pass away, and it the filling of the vacancy um, actually went into the federal voting uh, into the 45 day you know Yolkawa ballot deadline. So the parties could appoint a candidate um, within the 45 days. So if we we if they did take up all the time they had to appoint, we wouldn't have met the federal requirements. This bill would. Um, move that deadline to before the 45 days so we can get the ballots out in time. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Should, uh, could it, couldn't the candidate file within those 10 days? So the deadline was um, 40 days. Yeah. The, the current deadline is 40 days. That wouldn't allow us enough time to meet the federal requirements of uh, right. filing. Uh, filing candidates, producing ballots, and sending it out. That's why we're we're asking that we move that deadline so that we can meet it. So we're moving it up in, to allow for us to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Senator Kim. Question might not be totally related to the deadline, but in the case when it's like in the case of um, Senator Harimoto's situation, uh, the parties get to pick one. Is there a reason why we, we can't just let people apply? Because um, instead of each it, party. It, yeah, it happened after the primary election. So it went straight to the general. And if we had more than one candidate on per party in the general, it wouldn't have been like a true general election. It would have been more like a special election. So the way the law was written was it, it was like, um, the party appointed for the primary and they moved on to the general. Okay, because he passed away prior to the primary, but it's just a dead, it was just a matter of the deadlines, right? Correct. So because of, when, he, when he passed away, I believe the candidate filing deadline had passed or had closed. Right. So therefore, um, the way the law is currently structured, it would go straight to the general where the parties pick, each pick the nominee for the general election. Why, why couldn't we have done a, a special during that general? Because um, the, the way 17, the way the, the, or the way the law was structured is that we followed the 
the 17 law and that's so the way it's structured. We would have to change, we would have to change that. Correct. Law. Does yeah. this, does this um, bill cures that if you've already filed your papers um, that you cannot withdraw? And it, sh it should, um, like I said prior to when we introduced this bill, if you file your papers and a vacancy did happen after the one day to withdraw for any reason, you, uh, you couldn't um, withdraw to run for that seat. This moves up that, that deadline so that um, it coincides with the candidate filing deadline. Okay, so this, is, have that one this is this the exact same bill that uh, was, was uh, tried to get passed, be but because they put the retroactive in it, um, it didn't pass it. So is that the same language? It should be, it, we did propose that bill last session and this was the same bill. Same bill, okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, let me just double check. No, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Nago. We'll go ahead and move on to SB 528, which relates to political advertisements. It requires printed and electronic political advertising to prominently display candidate approval language on each page, increases the fines for violations. First up on 528 is Gary Cam, Campaign Steering Commission. Good morning, Chair, yeah. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this is Gary Cam on behalf of the Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, the commission will stand on its written comments. Okay, thank you. Next up is Sandy Ma, uh, Common, Common Cause of Hawaii. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Common Cause supports SB 528. We believe that it will provide more clarity as to campaign advertisements. There are confusion as to advertisements in the 2020 election. So we believe that this will provide more clarity for the general public who is not as uh, well versed in uh, campaign advertisements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Michael Galoyo Jr. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, senators. Thank you for hearing. The, um, thank you for hearing this bill. Michael Galoyo Jr. appearing on behalf of myself. Um, I'm one of the few people that actually I think that's going to be testifying today that actually filed a complaint with the Campaign Spending Commission based on the 2020 elections, the midweek um, front page thing, and I was shocked that they did not find that in violation that uh, to dig through that um, advertisement to find out at the very end that you were actually reading a political advertisement was not in violation of state law was a shock to me. Well, the way the campaign spending commission interprets the law. And so I hopefully that this bill will actually fix that loophole. And so that it protects the public. So they know when they're reading a public, political advertisement in a publication and they don't have to wait to the last third or fourth or fifth page in this case or never know until you click through on an electronic ad to make sure that people know that they are looking at political advertisements a paid for political advertisement and not what a majority of the uh, viewing public thought they were looking at which was an endorsement from midweek and so since midweek was this is the first time they ever sold their front page to a political political campaign that this shows that there is a great loophole within the um, campaign spending or way that the campaign spending commission interprets the law. So hopefully you will pass this law, close that loophole and protect the public. So the public knows when they're looking at political campaigns versus a um, actual true piece of journalism. Thank you. And I look, uh, I'll be available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have uh, Cheryl B in support, Playlock Takuda in support, Carolyn Kunitaki in support. Edward Hanel Jr. in support, Barbara Best in support, David Anderson in support, Andrea Quinn in support, Larry Meacham in support, Linda Morgan in support, and Lori Boyle in support. That's all the testimony we have. Members, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Senator Favela, uh, yes, yeah, Senator Favela, sorry. Yeah, I, I, um, I understand the, the nature of this bill, but the only thing that I don't understand is because, you know, like we have some young and new candidates, yeah? And in the beginning, it was okay. The fine wasn't that great, um, you know, when they got, um, you know, in violation or warning for a violation. I just worried about the people that is going to be running in the future. I'm not as well versed as a lot of the people that is, um, have been running in the elections and especially um, what um, um, Michael said in that ad 
um, that persons and persons knew it very well what it was doing. So that kind of can understand. But, you know, when you do advertisement on your banner or a leaflet that you hang on a door, um, I'm just afraid that that, that it, it might, um, you know, I'm not saying going to um, hinder, but it's just going to cause uh, a little bit more problem for the younger candidates or new candidates that's running for office. So that's just my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, let me just double check here. Um, no, I think I'm okay too. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Who can, I, can I just ask a question? I'm sorry. Sure, go ahead, Senator Kim. Yeah, from cap for campaign spending. Um, so I'm just looking at the testimony and you folks don't feel that you need to put it on each page? Um, that's correct. The commission did not find the midweek cover story. Uh, well, the commission found that the midweek cover story was in compliance with 11-391. Uh, and, and I guess that's why we have this bill to make the uh, disclaimer go on every page. Um, we, we have comments. We, we don't think it's necessary. If you read through the ad, the disclaimer was there at the very end where most, or practically all disclaimers occur, be it written, uh, video, video, visual, or any kinds of ad. That's where candidates put the disclaimer. Um, I, I, I guess, I guess you can disagree with that. Uh, but then you know, if you do, if you try to resolve that in such a broad manner in a case where, you know, there was so much flack that came from that, I'm not even sure if maybe he's going to offer the cover ad uh, um, situation uh, next time in 20, uh, 2022. Um, so we may be dealing with something that might not happen again. Um, and if we, if we address it with such a broad stroke, like we, like we put in our testimony, you know, if a, a lot of candidates do mailers, mailers have two sides, that's two pages. So you're gonna to have to put that disclaimer on each side or you're gonna be in violation. You know, candidates also do trifolds. You're gonna to have to have the disclaimer on all three sides of that trifold. So, I, you know, I, I just think some thought should be put into this before we, uh, before the legislature just passes something this broad. Uh, Cause you know, as, uh, as one of the speakers uh, said, uh, this is to resolve a specific issue, and that's the midweek cover story. You know, do you need to? Number one, do we need to address that issue if that might not happen again, or if, or it, or if the candidate, if they do it, if they do off the cover story, the candidate might remember the backlash and then put a disclaimer on the first page rather than the last page. You know, I, I. I the commission just doesn't know if there's a problem here that needs addressing. And if it, there is a problem that needs addressing, do we have to address it in such a broad way, which will cover all of the current ways in which you guys, uh, candidates, I'm sorry, uh, advertise? Okay, well, I, I believe there is a problem. And I am just surprised that as a campaign spending, you folks haven't, if you feel that this is, goes too far, that you folks didn't come up with some reasonable uh, method in which we can deal with this because my understanding in, in all my years of running is that the disclaimer is there to make it clear so people know right off the bat that who's paying for it and if it's not clear then you know you guys I, I, I thought that was the intent and being that that's the intent uh, I, I also felt that the midweek was very, very misleading and if it's misleading then it violates whatever it was the intent of having this disclaimer. So if there's other ways of having it to say that it needs to be clearly stated in the beginning um, and at the end, and maybe not on every single page, but you know, especially in, in, in medias in which it, it was always um, a complimentary type of article. And for, for the very first time it was sold as an ad and you know, nobody was familiar with that. Nobody really, really expected that it was sold. Um, so it is a unique situation, but it's not that it can't happen again. But I think it should be, you know, campaign spending should have taken the lead as to introduce something that would resolve the uh, fact that if it's misleading or if you can't, you can't um, 
determine that it is in fact a, cam a, a um, campaign ad and paid for that it needs to be. Um, right. Well, I, I, I don't think the page, but you guys need to address it um, instead of just saying that you don't think it's necessary and might not happen again. Well, I, I don't believe the commission, uh, the members felt that it was deceptive. The, the pages were all linked to each other. You know, I, I find that very hard to believe only because like I said, you know, it, it's never happened in the past. It's always been, uh, and I've been on the cover of Midweek, but it's all, not doing a campaign. And normally, um, you know, it is, it is not an, an ad. And so I, I myself didn't think it was, and it was misleading. And I myself thought it was just Midweek. And I was very critical uh, with Mr. Francis when I spoke to him regarding it. Um, because, you know, and if most people don't read the article, they just look at the cover. So, so why are, okay, well, if you don't read the misleading. article, okay, that's fair enough. Okay, members, any other questions? Senator Kiel Kaloli. The, uh, first of all, I think Senator Kim is absolutely right. The, many, many people, and we know this, I know this from campaign advertising, Many, many individuals will just take a look at the cover or the byline, and that's it. And so, um, I mean, that's a that's a well known that's a that, that that is a well known fact of advertising, regardless of the whether it's political or just general advertising. Uh, so, I guess it, you know to tag to tack on to Senator Kim's statements. And in acknowledgement of what Senator Favela said as well, because this is all really complicated to, to facilitate, especially for new, new candidates who don't have as much experience as we incumbents. The, the, is, there a, is there a precedent uh, amongst the, the commission um, or, or I guess somewhere in the statute that I haven't seen um, related to the definition of prominent when no. it comes to locating the notice? Well, the prominent requirement would not apply uh, to a candidate committee ad. But no, to answer your question, there is not a definition. So I think perhaps, you know, some sort of definition related to what it means to place a notice in a prominent location or to place a notice in a location that creates um, a misleading notion that the, that the, um, I don't even know how to quantify that the advertisement is not an advertisement. Might be a more specific uh, way to address this issue. This cannot be the first time, you know, because I recall when you folks uh, uh, in the middle of an election season elected to require campaigns to feature their candidate information on campaign signs. So this cannot be the first time you folks have ventured to address an issue uh, about notice of campaign advertisement. Isn't that, isn't that right? That's correct. So in prior rulings, there has to be some, in prior decisions that the commission have made on, on issues related to advertisements, there has to be some uh, um, uh, precedent as to what constitutes a prominent notice or what constitutes a misleading no notice? Well, this is the first issue we've had with a multi-page ad. And uh, as I stated, practically every ad that I've seen, the disclaimer comes at the end. So you more or less expect that's where the disclaimer is going to be. And if that's what you expect, then one could argue then that is a prominent location. Um, but remember now, if you look at this bill, it will affect any multi-page ads that that you that is commonly done, like a mailer or or a trifold. So if you guys are Mr. willing, Mr. Kama, to... I, I hear you and I and I respect what your comment as it relates to the specific uh, the the specific issue that the bill is attempting to solve. But I am trying to I, what I'm trying to say is. I think there's a larger issue at play here that Senator Kim is talking about that perhaps we should address in this bill, which is just in general, a notice for an advertisement, if we're all gonna be playing by the same fair rules here, 
the notice should be prominent and maybe we should specify what that means in general so that we don't have to put in these really specific um, directives in terms of page notifications and things. This, this doesn't address at all the banner ad situation, which is what we're talking about here. If somebody's looking at a cover, you can have a 64 font, you can have a half page notice on, the, on page 18, nobody's gonna ever see it. So I think that's something that is worth a further discussion on. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I, I guess I understand your answer. Thank you. Can I just add real quickly? Sure, sure. Uh, in the case of the midweek, the cover, I mean, it's like, it's not as if it's a multi, multi um, advertisement that is all together in one piece and you flip through it. You have to go back into this many pages before you get to the article. And then sometimes the article is continued on another page. Uh, and then that's the end of the article. So in, the, in this case where you have the ad on the very front um, and then you don't, it's not really connected. So I wouldn't say that it's a multi ad. So maybe we can clarify it in the, in the bill because to me, the cover itself is a, is, is a an ad by itself and it should have had the disclaimer there. And if the end of the story had the disclaimer, that's fine. But to have a cover on one page and then the story not until a couple other pages into this, this, this you know, huge um, uh, midweek newspaper um, it's like being on the Sunday in the Sunday page where you have your ad in the very top of the corner and you, you had another ad in, in the middle somewhere in section C3 and then you put the disclaimer. I don't think you folks would allow that. Right? I mean, you could say that's a multi ad because I have an ad in the front banner of the new Sunday paper and then I'm going to have a story inside and I'm going to have the disclaimer. To me, that's not even connected. I, so well, the, the the bill deals with multi-page ads, so I'm what I'm assuming is that we're dealing with one ad that has more pay, more than one page, other than you know several ads. Uh, of course, if you have several ads, they would all have to have its, their own disclaimer. Uh, so what I hear you discussing is that the 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 main problem lies with the fact that it was a cover ad. And if that, if the, if you guys find that that was a problem, then uh, I think it would be better to deal with a cover ad situation than just saying we're going to deal with multi-page advertisement because that's going to apply to so many of the stuff you guys do. And you know, I really, I don't think you really need disclaimers on two sides of a mailer. That, that's just too okay. much. Okay. Yeah, I happen, I happen to agree with you that. But again, without the campaign spending. Of taking a lead on this and and trying to resolve with the issue, but we're going to come up with our own ideas. So you know, um, so I'm glad that we had this discussion. So we're going to decision making. We can talk about that. So thank you. Okay, members, any other questions? Sure. Uh, Senator Casio. Just for the clar clarification too. So is there anything currently in the law that would prevent me, for example, from being featured on the front page of the weekly while I'm simultaneously campaigning? So it might not be seen as no, an ad, no. but essentially. Well, if it's a story about you, that's no problem. But then if you run an ad, then you have to have a disclaimer. Okay, but then in a sense, then if I'm already, if I'm already being featured just for my current role, it it, de it definitely doubles as an ad, and therefore it seems like it would then um, no, benefit incumbents. I'll, I'll let Gary answer, but I'm pretty That'd sure the a, answer is no. That would be a news story. To yeah. that. Okay. Okay, so then it benefits incumbent uh, incumbents, uh, essentially, and well, and a, non it, it, a, non in, a non incumbent could get a news story about them too. So it could, but the likelihood is not so much. And so basically, it benefits. There is a benefit to that. And if there's if there's kind of arrangements or agreements for how much ad you take out, you might get a cover story. Then it gets a little convoluted and seems no. to. No. Yeah. No. That, what yeah, happens no, it, is there's laws that says they have to give equal time and equal treatment, right? Well, I mean, you, no, I'm not sure. Bottom line is it's two separate categories. Now, if the if the okay. newspaper were to link them together somehow, I'm not sure how I'm not sure how campaign spending would view that. But if it's just a if it's just news coverage versus an ad, there's you don't have to put a disclaimer on the news coverage. It's not even your it's not yours to put the disclaimer on. 
it's theirs and they're, why would they, you know, that's their story. So right. anything well, else on that? I just want to say with the candidate, the, the other candidate can claim uh, equal time or, you know, fair, fair amount of time. They're supposed to do that. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to SB 635. Uh, SB 635 allows the Elections Commission to refer a complaint to the Attorney General or County Prosecutor in addition to any administrative determination and without the requirement that the Commission believes the respondent has recklessly, knowingly, or intentionally committed a crime, uh, disqualifies a person convicted of violating election criminal prosecution laws from holding elective public office for 10 years rather than the current four, and repeals language stipulating that election criminal prosecution law does not apply to any person who has paid or agrees to pay fines related to report filing violations and advertisement violations prior to the commencement of the proceedings. Uh, first up on 635 is Mr. Cam. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Morning. committee. Uh, the commission has uh, stands on its written testimony and support. Thank you. And we have an SB 635. Members, questions? Chair, I have a question for um, Mr. Cam. Senator um, Capio. Roughly how many candidates uh, would be uh, excluded at this point for, for this particular thing? What do you mean by excluded? Uh, oh, so, so basically, um, how many candidates pay fines currently for late reports or for getting to put a paid for by on their signage every election? Um, I don't have those figures with me. The vast majority of our cases involve late reports. And fines are paid. And fines are paid. So, but if they're fined... So then it's, I mean, do we have a, a ballpark percentage? I just feel like uh, it may wipe out 75% or more candidates being that there's so many fines for even just one one infraction. Well, there's already, there's uh, already I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gary. I'm sorry, well, the, Mr. Cam. This bill de deals with um, the independent prosecution of campaign spending commission, uh, campaign spending violations. So, it changes the law from right now where the commission, if they want to refer a case, they have to, uh, they cannot act administratively and then they can make a referral. What this bill does is makes the prosecution independent. So a prosecutor can choose to uh, prosecute a campaign spending violation without any input from the commission. Um, so I guess I don't understand the the question about so, taking candidates out. So Senator Casio, the the, uh, the fines for fi the, if you file your campaign spending commission report late, it's an automatic fine. And that, and a lot of people get fined. Other questions? Right. So wouldn't, but wouldn't that then make candidates not be able to hold office for 10 years? And that would be quite a number of well, well, there's no, nothing, nothing says that the, the prosecutor has to prosecute on, on a case like that. The prosecutor is not going to prosecute. They're just going to say, okay, they paid the fine. That's that. It's yeah. only if in, in the egregious cases where they would want to go after them for some reason. So is that specified though? Because that seems really. No, vague. it's just, it's just the practicalities of it. And it, so would it uh, again, would it also um, in be who, well, let's say more benefit to incumbents versus newer candidates if they were less aware of some of the peculiar particularities. Go oh, ahead and answer Mr. Cam if you like. So um, when it comes to a referral from the commission, so those don't happen often. And um, I can tell you that the referrals have been made uh, mainly for uh, uh, or uh, false name contribution, where you're not reporting the per person, uh, the real person that provided the money, that, that's a class C felony. Uh, I don't remember, I've never made a recommendation to the commission for a referral for a late report. Um, and, you know, for a criminal 
prosecution, you need a specific kind of in intent, which is not necessary in a civil fine uh, situation. So if someone just said, you know, forgot to do a report, that does not supply the requisite intent for it to be a criminal case, uh, as opposed to civil, where the question is, did you file the report, yes or no? Um, so we're not, the commission currently is not referring uh, cases for prosecution uh, often. Um, it, it just doesn't happen that often. And it, it, it has not happened with a, a, late, a late report. Okay. okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, SB 738. This removes, I don't know how to pronounce this, psilocybin and psilocin from the list of Schedule One substances requires the Department of Health to establish designated treatment centers for the therapeutic administration of psilocybin and psilocin, establishes a review panel to review and assess the effects of this measure. First up on 738 is uh, Laura Mayashiro, Deputy Attorney General, with comments. Department of Health. Good morning, Chair Lauren Kim, Representative of the Department of Health. Uh, the Department respectfully opposes this measure, uh, not on its merits, but on the fact that it uh, would require significant appropriation and it is um, uh, an inappropriate expansion of, of public health authority for general uh, treatment centers for um, administration of psilocybin. Thank you, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Next up is uh, Jared Rudella, uh, Radula, sorry, Radu Radula for Department of Public Safety. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jared Radula, the State Narcotics Enforcement Administrator. We stand on our testimony. We respectfully oppose the measure. Thank you. Q. Next is Ed Sniffen, Department of Transportation. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, David Rodriguez with the Department of Transportation. Morning. The DOT um, believes these substances impairs driving, and we stand on our written comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next is Philip Johnson, Honolulu Police Department. Good morning, Chair. World Road Committee. I'm Lieutenant Henry Lee of the Narcotics Vice Division, sitting in for Major Johnson. Thank okay. you for the opportunity to testify this morning. The Honolulu Peace Department strongly opposes Bill 738. Removing psilocybin and psilocin from the list of Schedule One substances will be detrimental to public safety. Psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms, can cause terrifying hallucinations. It can also cause feelings of euphoria and sensory distortion that are common to other hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD. A user, a user is often unable to discern fantasy from reality. It is also important to point out that the hallucinogenic properties of these drugs cause dizziness, blurry vision, impaired distant perception, objects appear to develop waves and wave-like patterns, and many others which will impair driving. Remo removing psilocybin and psilocin from Schedule 1 to 4 would eliminate them as a drug under the definition used in HRS 291 ECHO, the OVUI sections. This would effectively legalize driving under the influence of magic mushrooms. Lastly, we have seen these substances abused by our youth at rave gatherings, resulting in risky behavior, sexual assaults, hospitalization, as well as other criminal behavior. The Honolulu Police Department respectfully asks you to defer this measure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Mark Tom for the Department of the Prosecuting Attorney in Honolulu in opposition. Alan Johnson, Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition. Yeah, good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the opportunity, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, distinguished members. Uh, you know, uh, Hawaii Sons of Youth uh, Coalition does oppose, but for different reasons than you might imagine. Uh, you know, this has been an example of uh, science doing its job. Now that the barriers are down for us to begin testing illegal drugs, we've seen that there's some value here. So there's been some studies from the small kind. Now there were clinical trials done that said, hey, under certain situations, it has efficacy and it without adverse effects, but a couple of people died in those studies. It's a dangerous drug, you know, it shouldn't be anywhere near the public, but under certain protocols with light, with great training, 
and you measure those thresholds of the toxicity, it seems to have some value. So as you know, uh, you may not know, in 2020, the United States invested big dollars into big clinical trials. So this is science working. And they're saying it's not safe yet, but they not very many drugs make it to these big clinical trials. So they're investing in it. And part of the investment is, well, yeah, we recognize it's not a magic pill. Magic mushrooms won't be a magic pill. And we have great treatments and great medications already. So this is just going to augment it. But it's opening the door to brain research in a new level that we've never looked at before. And we're really hopeful for that. But the world has said, and the United States has said, it's, we're not ready. We don't have all the safety issues figured out. I mean, if you use alcohol, yeah, great. But if you use alcohol and methamphetamine, ooh, it was bad news. So we got to figure these things out. And, you know, there's a promise here, not for the public, but for science. So the world is investing in this. And they're going to make it. They're going to figure it out to be safe. And there's a lot of potential here for what other science, this might lead us in science. So we're opposing because we don't want to, we wouldn't be the first state, we'd be the first one in the world when the world says it's not ready yet. So let's not be the first in the world. But uh, it's coming. And, it's, uh, and it shows you that the science can help lead us out of our own uh, prejudice and biases, but in a certain way when we know it can work well. So thanks for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Next is Doraya Shin, uh, Clarity Project. Aloha, Chair. Aloha, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Doraya Shin. I'm uh, testifying on behalf of the Clarity Project today in wholehearted support of SB 738. Uh, the Clarity Project is a citizen-driven initiative, and we aim to expand patient access to include psilocybin-assisted therapy modalities in the state of Hawaii. And we represent thousands of community members who strongly support SB 738. And our community also includes medical professionals, kapuna advocates, researchers, veterans suffering from PTSD, uh, and many more. We are a part of a growing national and global movement to advocate for legalizing access to medical psilocybin. So just as some background, you know, psilocybin, it's a natural fungi. Um, found in over 200 species, found on all continents um, around the world. And in clinical studies, um, they use a pure synthetic form of psilocybin to control safety and dosing standards. Um, this is not an addictive substance. It does not lead to physical dependence. And in fact, uh, you know, breakthrough studies have shown that psilocybin is one of the most effective medicines to actually um, eliminate addiction completely from folks who have had issues with that. Um, the toxicity of this drug is also extremely low. You would have to eat one third of your weight um, in psilocybin to reach a lethal dose. So safer than um, many of our legal drugs and pharmaceuticals that are currently on the market. Um, in my testimony, I include a, a bevy of scientific research, um, a lot of them being landmark studies, um, <clears throat> clinical research from Johns Hopkins University and many other places. And I also just want to share that while there might be some hesitancy and fear, even the, the FDA federally has granted breakthrough therapy designation for psilocybin. Um, so according to the FDA themselves, this is a process designed to expedite the development of drugs that are intended to treat a serious condition in which preliminary clinical evidence indicates that the drug is a substantial improvement. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Members, at this point, I'm going I'm to call for a, what time is it? Uh, about a three-minute recess. So we'll come back at 10.17, um, short recess. Okay, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee hearing on uh, SB 738 having to do with uh, psilo psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, next up, next testifier is Nikos Leverance, Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. Morning, uh, Chair, Vice Chair Morning. members, Nikos Leverance with Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. Um, psilocybin is a substance that's been used for thousands of years for medicinal and therapeutic purposes. Um, it's currently decriminalized in the state of Oregon and other jurisdictions. And there was an emerging body of research that, that came in the 50s and 60s uh, 
uh, that would have met uh, Western scientific standards. But what happened? What happened was authoritarian politics in the Controlled Substances Act. And by the Controlled Substances Act own criteria, specifically potential for abuse and accepted medical use, psilocybin should not be a Schedule One substance. So to the extent that this bill would facilitate good scientific research and reach people like veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, we strongly support this bill and we encourage uh, its passage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is John Atanasio, still with Thera Inc, CEO. Yes, uh, good morning, Aloha. Good morning. I'd, like to, I'd like to thank the chair, the vice chair, and the committee. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Silothera. Uh, we're an emerging, um, pioneering uh, company that's doing a drug development of uh, psilocybin um, um, uh, formulations for treatment of depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, Alzheimer's, and dementia, as well as eating disorders. And we are fully in, in support of. Uh, not only decriminalization, but eventual legalization to follow on other states like Oregon and decriminalization that we just had over the election uh, in places like uh, DC and also other states like uh, uh, Texas and Houston and also in, in uh, Oakland, California, it's been uh, decriminalized. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we, are, we are in the midst of a global healthcare uh, crisis. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, approximately 322 million people have been diagnosed with major depression disorder. And I have to imagine, even based on, and I, and I respect all, uh, everybody has come before me and gave them their opinion in opposition, but the Department of Health here in Hawaii just uh, initiated just the last couple of days of uh, their findings of what's happened you know, during this pandemic on our population. More people are at risk. Uh, the economically disadvantaged are particularly at risk, and those that had pre-existing conditions of mental illness are, are really in a, a difficult uh, situation. Uh, here in the United States, 16 million people uh, suffer from clinical depression. And what's really, really uh, interesting about that, it's been widely reported that about a third of that population is considered treatment resistant by use of you know, uh, current uh, medications and antidepressants. And what I mean by uh, uh, being treatment resistant is that uh, patients have gone through two or three different uh, therapeutic processes uh, and they find themselves um, basically on the hamster wheel, coming back, uh, getting treatment, getting better for a period of time, and then, then not. Okay. Thank you but, very much. Appreciate your testimony. Next up is Thomas Cook, MD, testifying for Beyond Mental Health. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, I am a board certified psychiatrist in uh, Honolulu. And I'd like to give the legislature my, uh, my opinion on the clinical effects of psilocybin. Over the years, I've collected reports from patients who are driven by unresolved symptoms to try them illegally. And many of these are combat vets, mothers, church going people, the kind of people otherwise unlikely to experiment with uh, illegal drugs. Most of them try them after having read promising reports of research done at Johns Hopkins and other places. The unanimous response is that the mushrooms uh, relieve their depression better and faster than any medication ever has. Some of these patients have been on meds for two decades, and they report suicidal thinking has vanished. Uh, and that phenomenon, which I've seen here in Honolulu, is borne out by the literature. A 2015 paper by Peter Hendricks and Roland Griffiths compared two groups, those that have ever used psilocybin and those that have never used psilocybin, and the likelihood of suicidal thinking or attempts within the past year was 58% in the group that had used psilocybin. So those that have never used psilocybin are at a 1.7 times greater risk of ever having thought or attempted suicide in the past year. Uh, please be aware that prescription antidepressants do not decrease the suicide rate. We have fully 17 to 18% of the population on antidepressants now. In the 90s, that number was around 7%. So we've almost tripled the number of people on antidepressants uh, and suicide rates are still going up. Um, this bill is allowing for designated or calling for designated treatment centers. And I have a treatment center already, my clinic is ready to monitor for safety and manage drug interactions and screen out those with complicating issues. There's really no reason why we can't do this now. And uh, the sooner we allow this bill, the sooner 
we can reduce Hawaii's suicide rate. Uh, and I'm available for any technical medical questions at the end of uh, the hearing. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Hope Kalai for Malama Molo A'a in support, Sam Chapman Healing Advocacy Fund in support, James Brad Sheveland for Maui Moringa Farms in support, Kate Cat Brady, Community Alliance on Prisons in support. And next is Ashley Lukens, who was here. Good morning. Aloha, everybody, members of the committee. My name is Ashley Lukens, and I'm a longtime resident of Hawaii and advocate at the Hawaii State Legislature. But I come to you today as someone living with brain cancer who's had the opportunity to access the transformative healing power of psilocybin in my own life. And I'm a part of the citizens who helped found the Clarity Project to push legislation like this forward. To have access, safe, legal access to medicines that profoundly transform cancer patients' relationships to their diagnosis allows them to reduce the stress related to cancer and ultimately open up the possibility of healing. And what our current statute forces cancer patients like myself to do is what Dr. Cook spoke of, access these substances illegally without the support of medical professionals and without the ability to work with those professionals on long-term integration. We can access integration services through therapy, but we need safe legal access to these medicines. So I think this bill, along with bills that have been introduced last year help start a really important conversation that brings us up to standard with the current medical research that can actually transform people's lives in ways that are not accessible through the current pharmaceutical model. So I really, really encourage the senators to move this bill forward and help us continue this conversation because for a cancer patient like myself, to be able to live at peace with my own diagnosis and to be able to move forward every day in my life makes all the difference. Thanks so much for the opportunity to testify. And as a founder of the Clarity Project, I'm also able to answer technical questions. Thank you very much. Sorry to hear your diagnosis. Next is uh, Noe Loik Al Charlotte or Charlo. Thank you. Morning. My name is Noelle Louis Kao Charlo. I'm a, I'm a physicist and one of my degrees is in biological engineering with a specialty in molecular dynamics and neuroscience. I'd like to reiterate that the consensus of the scientific community is that this treatment is more effective than many of the things we are constantly distributing to the population. Not only that, the neurotoxicity and half-life is comparable to caffeine. But I'd like to take my time and not reiterate some of the other points people have made and instead explain what's going on here physically. Serotonin, I'm sure you've all heard of it, is a neurotransmitter which your brain is constantly pushing around in pattern recognition and pattern execution. A lot of people think that it's more about mood and digestion. It's really about, it's about patterns. And what's going on is it, psilocybin, is a, it's a structural analog of serotonin. So it's almost the same molecule, it just has a slight tweak, okay? And what that tweak does is it changes the binding affinity or how quickly and how much it gets pushed around the brain. And so for people with intense serotonogenic disorders like depression, anxiety, obsession, PTSD, this changes everything. Like it, it, if you read the literature, it's one of the most shocking things in science, okay? And it's one of the few things I can say as a scientist and as a person is good. It's very hard to make that statement. And other people have talked about like the need for further research and understanding of, of the levels and uh, what prior conditions are necessary for someone to take or not take the substance. I agree. So we should be legalizing it so we can study it and understand the effects of, of the human potential here, because it's tremendous. It, it's amazing. And I'm saying that, you know, not just as a scientist, but I'm here because I care about these human stories, you know, about the people whose lives could be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Jeremiah Holguin. Good morning. Good morning. Aloha kakahiaka. 
I'm here in support for this bill. I run a private consultation business focused solely around rhetorically extrapolating the cutting edge of research, innovation, and breakthroughs for all matters relating to holistic human health and high performance. I work alongside world-renowned doctors. I consult for educators involved with government, municipalities, CEOs, PhD, Grammy award-winning musicians, and even some of your favorite A-list actors. This grew out of my own um, struggle with neurological and physical disabilities. And I'm here to speak only about the empirical data for those who may not be aware of the accruing research that has been steadily surmounting over the last few decades. This testimony is to help bring to the table a morally congruent and concrete understanding for those who may be on the fence about the matter. As a Schedule One narcotic, something is deemed to have no medical value, and upon thorough examination of the empirical evidence, psilocybin can no longer fall under this category. There are over 40 institutions right now in the United States actively doing research into psilocybin for its neuroregenerative capabilities and its potent implications in psychiatry. This is a small list of those institutions. John Hopkins University, the Purdue College of Pharmacy, the New York State Psychiatric Institute, the US Department of Veteran Affairs, Yale University, and Harvard Medical School. And in order to receive the regulatory oversight from the DEA and FDA, it has to have demonstrated three things. Unlikely to do any harm, provide a critical need that is not being addressed by conventional medicine, and is it easily scalable and an affordable medicine. In addition to this, there's currently two dozen European universities running similar concurrent research. The following is just one study published in the Journal of Neurotherapeutics in 2017 titled Potential Therapeutic Effects of Psilocybin. I read verbatim. The current state of modern research suggests considerable therapeutic promise for psilocybin. The research is most advanced regarding the treatment of cancer-related psychiatric disorders with three randomized placebo-controlled trials showing promising results for psilocybin. Two of these trials involved a moderate number of participants and administered relatively large doses of psilocybin. These two studies in particular provide strong evidence for the substantial decrease in depressive and anxious systems, symptoms that appear to persist for at least six months after a single act of treatment. Such results are unprecedented in psychiatry. The single open label study of treatment resistant depression outside of the context of cancer provides initial preliminary evidence that persistent antidepressant effects of psilocybin might not just be limited to those with cancer. There was a rodent study published a couple of months ago looking into the mechanism of action from Aarhus University, published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology 2020. Uh, the conclusion was this present study demonstrates that psilocybin rapidly induces gene expression related to neuroplasticity biased towards the prefrontal cortex as opposed to the hippocampus. Our findings provide further evidence for the rapid plasticity promoting effects of psilocybin. More research needs to be done into the neurogenesis effects of psilocybin mushrooms for the treatment of these neurological disorders. And there is a great enough evidence already showing that it is a powerful therapeutic agent. We are under more stress than ever due to the current state of affairs, and we need to utilize as many tools as we can accrue. Once again, I'd just like to mention that this your is a time, minute fraction of the studies your and time the medical is institutions. Up. Thank you. Aloha, no. Jennifer Colota. Hi, Sandra. They're not present. Okay, in support. Okay, after this, we have uh, half a page in support, uh, another page completely in support every single individual the another page with it looks like one in opposition and then about 15 more uh, maybe not quite that many uh, one two three and about 10 more all but one in up all but one in up I mean sorry all but one in support okay members any questions on 738 SB 738. Yeah, again, again questions. Um, so what is the what, what would be the process? Who are you asking? Yeah, um, any of the doctors or experts that talk about um, depression and uh, cancer. What is the process of processing this, getting it to the medical field? I don't know who's who's still here. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Thomas Cook. I can speak to that. Okay, go ahead. Well, the bill's proposing setting up designated treatment centers uh, and uh, having a task force to monitor 
the clinic for safety. My clinic currently treats severe treatment resistant depression with ketamine. That's a drug that can cause a temporary two hour psychosis that profoundly uh, heals depression much in the way psilocybin does. Ketamine has been in use the past many years and it's an old anesthesia drug from the seventies. Uh, it was used in the cave in Thailand to rescue the boys um, uh, a couple years ago. It was in the news for that reason. But psilocybin is even more effective than ketamine. And so we already have infrastructure to set this up. I know a couple other doctors who could also have uh, their clinic serve as a safe uh, designated treatment center. We screen out people at risk for risk of psychosis um, and other drug interaction problems. There's no reason this couldn't be uh, safely implemented right away. Yeah, so just follow up with this. I'm just yeah, listening. I mean, I, I know this does a lot of um, big things. I'm not an expert in any of these things that you guys are claiming that it does and do do, oh, excuse me, excuse me, that it does um, going forward. But the same thing with um, hemp, um, oils, and then uh, marijuana. Uh, we was told that marijuana helps with cancer patients. Um, uh, marijuana also helps with depression. So what is the difference? I mean, what is the, I mean, I understand that there's a need for it, but I'm just trying to get an understanding that what is, what is this medicine that is so um, potent or, or whatever it is that, that we treat marijuana, uh, medical marijuana to be accessible to everybody for almost the same reasons of what you guys are giving, um, almost similar same reasons of what you guys are talking about the, this other drug? Well, ma marijuana uh, has risk, may minor risk for increasing uh, psychosis when it's abused in use, but uh, you know, alcohol can cause dementia and motor vehicle accidents and increase risk of lethal overdose and liver cancer. So we legalize things overall for other reasons, but a psilocybin can be made uh, safe in a medical context only. Uh, cannabis is currently being self-managed by medical patients. Doc as a doctor, I'm not allowed to uh, you know, prescribe a specific cannabis dose to patient. I just give them permission, essentially, whereas uh, the psilocybin could be given while in office uh, only. Uh, you know, if there's a designated treatment center, the person is being monitored the whole time. Okay. Members, any other questions? Thank you. Thank me, you, Chair. Thank you. Let me go to Senator Gabbard. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Charlot, if he's still available. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, just curious. Aside from the mushrooms, are there any, are there any other illegal drugs that contain psilocybin? Is it, um, is it from mushrooms. So, uh, I mean, no, pretty much. But psilocybin, like I said, it's a structural analog of serotonin. So what that means is it's basically nearly the same molecule, and um, this is in general how drugs function they bind to receptors in the brain by having a simil similar chemical composition. Um, others are much more different than uh, naturally occurring neurotransmitters. Uh, psilocybin itself is very similar to serotonin. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll go and move on to the next bill, which is SB, thank you everyone for being here to testify, SB 157. This authorizes the issuance of a civil license to solemnize marriage and allows solemnization by any individual at least 18 years of age. First up on SB 157 is Department of Health. Good morning, Chair Long Kim, Department of Health. We strongly support this yeah. measure and urge it passing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Michael Coloyo Jr. in support, Cheryl B. in support, Alan Orosaki in support. Uh, uh, Scott Smart with comments and Kirsten, Kristen Alice in support. That's all the testimony we have on 157. Members, any questions? Senator Casio. This is to Department of Health. Um, does a pr uh, priest need to be licensed in order to solemnize a marriage? Uh, they need to be registered with us because there's an exchange of information. Uh, but they are authorized by law. Licenses is, is just a kind of a uh, procedural formality, uh, but they are priests or clergy are 
uh, lawfully authorized to solemnize marriages. So the procedure, and at the risk of repeating myself, is, is to obtain a license because we need to exchange information. And um, are there current abuses happening with this that would require, you know, so that we would need to now license uh, lay people for the same reason? Like, are there current uh, abuses? I don't, I don't believe abuse. I'm not aware of abuse. Uh, the purpose of this bill is basically parity is to for those who have no religious affiliation or simply choose not to have a solemnization uh, with a religiously affiliated entity to allow them that option. Um, I'm not aware of abuse if there are quote unquote illegal marriages and I'm using that term very glibly going on. Uh, they all need to be registered with the Department of Health. And if there is a complaint that a non-licensed person was uh, officiating a marriage, that may interfere with its registration. So just one more clarifying question. So this bill would make a, that priests do not need to get a license, but lay people do. They need to only, the priests only need to be, so if they're affiliated with a religion, they don't need to be licensed, they just need to be registered. Um, I, see, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, I, I see what you're getting at. Um, officiants uh, do, let me, let me clarify, officiants do need a license. So uh, they, uh, although clergy may come from a, a, an organization that has been historically and legally authorized to officiate marriages, uh, they still need to license themselves with us. So we do recognize, they, they do need to exchange information with us and that is accomplished via a license that we officially recognize them. Um, and it, I guess maybe I'm surmising that the question of abuse comes from what if someone just declares, uh, I just started this religious and, uh, and, uh, organization yesterday, therefore I am authorized to conduct this marriage. Um, we are, that generally doesn't happen. Uh, I suppose it, it, it could happen, but the licensing process uh, is there to make sure that the, um, the, the, the officiants have the training and the background and are aware of the legal requirements to make sure that the marriage is correctly registered with the Department of Health. So they would, the same standard would apply to anybody who would be legally authorized to officiate a marriage. Uh, this just expands it to those who may not have a religious affiliation, but if I'm understanding the, your uh, question correctly, um, we do apply the same standard to anybody with the legal authority to uh, officiate a marriage. Okay, no, okay. That, that clarifies it. Thank you. Members, any other questions? I do have one question for you, Mr. Kim. Um, so under the terms of this bill, then if you were a, a member of the clergy, it would just become irrelevant. You could, you could, as a member of the clergy, you could come in and say, I want to solemnize marriages. You sign up, you can solemnize marriages. Is that correct? You, you still need to uh, work with the Department of Health to uh, be authorized to do so. So uh, again, we need to make sure that your credentials and the entity with which you're affiliated is legitimate. Well, what, um, I'm, what I'm suggesting is if you you could just sign up as, regardless of your affiliation, right? Uh, according to this bill, if you do not have a religious affiliation, yes, you could sign up to be a marriage so, officiant. And then if you wanted, if you, if your church or your synagogue or whatever religious organization you're a member of, you wanted to solemnize in their facilities or under their rights, then you'd have to do the other thing for that. But if you just wanted to marry somebody, you could just sign up in this, this separate process. Yes. I believe the bill as written would authorize that. There, there has been some discussion about um, amending, uh, I think the house put in a provision where you need the written consent of both parties being married. Um, that, that might be a prudent amendment, just make sure that everybody agrees to the terms and everybody is aware of what's uh, procedurally necessary to make sure that this marriage or civil union is solemnized in a in uh, an appropriate manner, okay. um, but yes. Members, any other questions on this one? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Kim. Um, we'll move on to SB 159. This requires any person who is eligible to vote uh, and applies for a motor vehicle driver's license or ID card to be automatically registered to vote unless the applicant affirmatively, affirmatively declines. 
and allows an applicant to affirmatively decline to have any of the applicant's information electronically transmitted, authorize access to an electronic transmission of databases maintained or operated by the counties or the Department of Transportation that contains driver's licenses or identification card information to election officials on the online voter registration system. First up on SB 159 is Scott Nago for uh, Chief Elections Officer. Morning again. Thank you, the Office. The Office of Elections stands on its written testimony and support, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Cara Jabolas Karoulas for the State Commission on the Status of Women and Support. Jade K. Fountain Tanigawa, uh, Office of County Clerk, County of Kauai in support. Uh, Janet Mason, League of we, uh, we, no, excuse me, League of Women Voters of Hawaii. Hey, Senator, they're not present. Not present. They're in support. Michael Galoyo Jr. for LGBT Caucus, Democratic Party of Hawaii. Uh, good morning again, morning. Uh, Senators. Thank you for hearing this bill. The LGBT Caucus stands in strong support of automatic voter registration. This is not. It helps lower barriers for people to be able to make sure that they're registered to vote. And as we've seen with the mail-in voting being such a huge success, that this will also incur a bit making sure that other people are able to register to vote. Uh, especially with minority communities, we see time and time again that uh, by lowering their uh, the, the barriers to making sure that they get a ballot um, makes it easier and more likely that they will participate in the um, democratic process. So on behalf of the LGBT caucus, I do encourage you to pass this bill out. We, uh, we stand behind it 100% and we wanna thank you for hearing this bill and have a happy Aloha Friday. Thank you, you too. Uh, next up is Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii and Hawaii Women's Coalition. Morning again. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you for hearing this bill. We support SB 159. I wanna say that automatic voter registration does not mean that everyone is automatically registered to vote. What it does mean is that when someone interacts with the Department of Motor Vehicles, to get a new driver's license or a new state identification or to update their driver's license information or update their state identification information. At that time, they will have the option of registering to vote. And if they do not opt out of registering to vote, that information, the voter registration information is automatically, that's what automatic voter registration means, that voter registration information is automatically transferred to the state elections or county elections offices. So a person is registered to vote or their voter registration information is updated. So a person has to interact with the Department of Motor Vehicles in order to be registered to vote or have their voter uh, registration information updated. So this is a good policy uh, voter uh, monitors, voter uh, modernization policy for the state of Hawaii. Uh, it saves uh, money um, and it uh, updates our vote by mail system to ensure that the vote by mail ballot gets to the correct addresses. Uh, so we uh, absolutely support this measure, this nonpartisan measure. Uh, Common Cause uh, Hawaii is also part of Automatic Voter Registration Coalition and I'm testifying on behalf of the Automatic Voter Registration Coalition this is a coalition of unions, of nonprofits, other nonprofits. Unions include uh, HGEA, nonprofits of women's associations such as AAUW, um, uh, of um, environmental organizations such as 350.org, um, and other groups. Um, these groups also support uh, automatic voter registration, given that uh, we understand. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Nikos Leverance for the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Good, morning. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair members, Nikos Leverance with Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. We're a proud member of the ABR Coalition. We would note that uh, this bill would increase registration rates, clean up the voter rolls, and save the state's money, as noted by the uh, Brennan Center for Justice in our testimony. And I would also add that as so many states on the continent are looking to restrict voter access. Uh, it's incumbent upon the legislature here to build upon the success of its mail-in voter system and ensure that uh, more people participate and uh, more, both through this mechanism and through more voter service centers. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Next up is Audrey Suga Nakagawa for AARP Hawaii. Good morning, Senator, members morning. of the committee. This is Audrey Suga Nakagawa, Advocacy Director mm -hmm. for AARP Hawaii, and we support this bill. Um, AARP supports good policies that uh, encourage and promote maximum participation for those in the electoral process. And so, as you know, many older adults tend to be registered voters, and this really makes it easier for them to update any of their information when they renew their license or apply for a state ID. What I also like about this bill is the fact that it also encourages young voters. And so, for example, my daughter, who was 17, had a provisional driver's license, and she just turned 18. And so when she had to go and update her driver's license, this would automatically update her registry. Uh, this would enroll her in the, the uh, to become a registered voter. So we really like this type of policies that will encourage more and more participation. So thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Thank you very much. Next is Hope Kruppelman, uh, ACLU of Hawaii. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, morning. members of the committee. Uh, my name is Hope Kruppelman. I'm the Legal and Legislative Fellow at the ACLU of Hawaii. Thank you for the chance to testify. The ACLU of Hawaii strongly supports this bill, which would streamline the voter registration process and also add Hawaii to a growing list of states that have already passed similar laws. Voting is the foundation of our democracy and a fundamental right that protects all of our other civil rights and civil liberties. This bill would help facilitate registration for eligible voters, update the rules, especially voters' addresses, and lead to more efficient and cost-saving elections. The United States is one of the only countries in the world that requires voter registration, but places the burden on voters to register themselves. This is thought to be a major reason why voter turnout in the U.S. is relatively low. As a result, we strongly support this measure as we believe it would promote maximum participation in the democratic process and thus enable more free and fair elections in our state. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we have Amy Monk for Women's Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii in support. Lori Field, Planned Parenthood, Northwestern Hawaii uh, in support. Young, Youngji Overly, AAUW of Hawaii in support. John Bickle, Americans for Democratic Action in support. Will Karen, Young Progressive Demanding Action in support. Uh, Jody Malinsky, Malinowski, Sierra Club of Hawaii in support. Pride at Work Hawaii in support. Jessica Yamauchi, Executive Director, Hawaii Public Health Institute in support. David Bruce Leonard, Earth Medicine Institute in support. Randy Pereira, Hawaii Government Employees Association in support. Cat Brady Community Alliance on Prisons in support. Mitzi Higa, Hawaii State Teachers Association in support. Next we have Kristen Alice, who I believe is here. Good morning. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Kristen Alice and I live in Hilo. I work for a homeless services organization, but I am testifying in my personal capacity today. When our neighbors experiencing homelessness come to social services, they often have lost everything. Not just their homes, but their transportation, their vital documents, their ID, and their connection to the community. Living on the streets rough and without a safe place to store those documents, they often get destroyed or lost, stolen, etc. When social services staff assist our neighbors who are overcoming homelessness, they recognize the need to take care of the whole person. So that means in addition to helping them move into permanent housing, they're helping them obtain identification, get those documents back, um, connect them with financial and social services, medical services. They're off also providing financial education and household management and renter education and helping them integrate into the community. In short, our houseless neighbors have to jump through hoop after hoop just to overcome what might be the most traumatic experience of their lives. Um, last year, with the assistance of the County Office of Elections, I helped organize a voter registration drive and ballot collection at shelters across the island. Um, it was a coordinated effort, involved a lot of phone calls, visits to the office, and working with staff to have drop off and pick up times at shelters from Hilo to Kona and beyond. Um, and it was great, it was successful, but if this bill were passed, that would be taken care of when our staff are connecting them with those documents um, from the beginning, when they're helping them get those IDs. So this is a great way to help our houses community integrate back into the community. And thank you for hearing this bill and thank you for hearing my testimony, mahalo. Thank you very much. Okay, the remaining, nobody else has signed up for in-person testimony. There's about mm, 15 on this page, all but one are in support. 
On this next page, there's about 15 more, including the Department of Transportation, the Hawaii Friends of Civil Rights, Save Medicaid for Hawaii, that are all in support. So at this point, members, we have to hard stop in about five minutes here, but members, if you have questions, just, uh, go ahead. No questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the next bill. Um, Chair, are we gonna do decision-making today? I don't think we're gonna make it. Okay. We'll, we'll put it off till next week. We'll see how it goes here in the next couple of minutes, but I don't think so. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I do have a question. Let's see, who was here from uh, Office of Elections? Yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Uh, the, the House added language to a similar bill that would shield from penalty an ineligible person who was automatically registered to vote unless the person took voluntary action to register to vote, knowing they were ineligible. It also shields an ineligible person who votes or attempts to vote. Do you have an, an assessment as to whether that kind of language might be needed here? So I think they put that language in there in case somebody inadvertently was registered, even though they didn't qualify. Uh, the application for a driver's license in order to register should have the, the three questions. Are you a citizen? Are you a resident of Hawaii? And are you 18 years of age? And um, an applicant would have to affirmatively say Eight. yes to all those. I'm sorry, 18 years of age? You can register at 16, right? But to vote. So you can oh. pre-register at 16, but to vote, you have to be 18. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Go ahead. So in, in case somebody inadvertently, or if I believe it's the driver's license sent that form over to register that person, it would protect that person from inadvertently being registered. Okay, and it would also mean that people who aren't eligible to register don't get registered. Correct, they shouldn't be sent anyway. Okay, uh, one of the county clerks requested the language that the applicant's information not be transmitted if the applicant presents a document that demonstrates lack of US citizenship. How does the state ensure that individuals who are not eligible eligible to vote do not register to vote so i believe the bill already or the bill already says that if you are not a citizen that the dot will not trans, transfer transmit that, the um, application transmit that information to you already so that is already in the existing bill okay all right thank you okay members any other questions all right thank you very much mr nago we'll move on to um sb 189 this removes the requirement to prove that the dog, a dog has bitten on two separate occasions for a dog bite victim to bring legal action against a dog's owner. Uh, first up on SB 189 is Cheryl B with comments and Andrea Quinn in support. That's all the testimony we have on that one and there's no one to ask questions of. So we'll go ahead and move on to SB 278. 278 prohibits the micro targeting of political advertisements on television and social media based on online behavioral data, demographic characteristics, and geographic location below the electoral district level. First up on 278 is Gary Cam, campaign spending. Good morning again, Chair, morning, Vice Chair, members of the committee. The commission stands on its written uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Sandy Ma, Common Cause. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii. We provided comments on this bill. We're concerned that it may raise uh, campaign spending costs for smaller uh, campaigns, such as neighbor island county council races. Uh, so we are concerned about uh, uh, that unintended uh, consequence of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rose Feliciano for Internet, uh, Internet Association. Uh, Aloha, Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Rose Feliciano. I'm with Internet Association. We did submit written comments. Um, a couple of points I would just like to raise in addition to the comments. Um, uh, as with uh, Ms. Ma, we are concerned that this will have a disproportionate effect on underserved, underrepresented, and people of color and down ballot races because micro targeting allows you to. Uh, reach voters that you otherwise would not be able to uh, contact without um, significant funds. Also, the definitions are very broad and it could have unintended consequences. For an example, if there's an, an issue important to Native Hawaiians, um, this bill would prohibit being able to reach out with democratic uh, de demographic tools 
to reach that population. Um, this also could hold for um, the elderly. So with that uh, concerns, I apologize. I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, Internet Association uh, requests you not move this bill forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is the Libertarian, uh, Tracy Ryan, Libertarian Party of Hawaii in opposition, Edward Hanel Jr. in with comments, Andrea Quinn in support, Natalie Wassa in opposition. Uh, members, any questions? Okay, considering the time, we will go ahead and end it there and we will do decision making. Uh, let's see, let me find the date we were going to do decision making. Uh, so we'll defer until Tuesday, which I don't know what the date is on Tuesday, sorry. 23rd, does that sound right? We'll defer decision making till Tuesday, the 23rd of February at 9.40 a.m., 9.40 a.m., and that'll be by video conference as well. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Have a good, uh, have a good weekend. Take care.